you are trying to pick up where my accent's from to start off with, it's from the northeast. I was born in Middlesbrough <laughs> and um, my parents are Italian, so I've got a bit of a mixture of um, an accent. So I have two sons who are autistic, Patrick's 28 and he's got Asperger's syndrome and Angelo is 25, he has autism, he's got a sensory processing difficulties and also nocturnal epilepsy. Can I ask how many parents are in the room? Put your hands up. Proud parents. How about professionals? Woohoo, good. No grandparents? Adults who are autistic? So a real mixture today. I'll just tell you very quickly, I went to, um, to be asked to do a talk for um, some Indian ladies and there was 200 Indian ladies and apparently they have an event once a year. And some of these ladies, it's the only event that they ever go to, so that's their highlight of the year. So um, I went along and I was asked to give a talk. And the reason I was asked to give a talk was because of one of our volunteers, Tally, um, she used to take her son to the temple, but because he's autistic, he was making noises, she was asked not to bring him back anymore. So we thought we need to give a presentation. So I started my talk and I said, how many parents of children who are autistic in the audience? Nobody put their hand up. I said, how many people are related to someone with autism? Again, no one put their hand up. I asked, did anyone know anyone who was autistic? There was one lady on the front row who put her hand up and she was a teacher. So I gave my presentation and then what happened at the end as I was leaving the room, nine mums ran after me and said, thank you very much for sharing the awareness about autism. We've got children with autism, but we were afraid, and I'll just say that again, afraid to say it in front of everybody. And I said, why? So they said, oh, it's the stigma that's attached. And I thought, is that still going on in this century? So since then, they now have said that we're going to be part of their group and we're going to start workshops and we're going to raise more awareness. And I was invited to the temple where Tally went along and we gave a talk. So we're starting to make a few waves. I just wanted to share that with you. So Patrick and Angelo, they were diagnosed quite early on. So if you've heard my story before, I'm sorry, but I just need to give a little bit of background so you know why I'm doing what I'm doing. So Patrick was diagnosed, he was premature, he was only two pounds when he was born. I had preeclampsia and toxemia for both pregnancies, so my body didn't like to be pregnant. Um, and Patrick was born two pounds. He had a lot of difficulties and um, we really went through the mill. He was in hospital for about 10 weeks. So Patrick um, had uh, rickets, he had um, lots of chest problems, he picked up whooping cough, you name it, he seemed to pick it up for the first three years of his life. And he used to find it difficult to play with other children in the nursery. And I thought it was because he had so many problems, he was in and out of hospital all the time, and I thought that was the difficulties that he was experiencing. And we were going to see the consultant paediatrician to make sure he was passing his milestones. Angelo was diagnosed quite early on, when he was three years old. Now Angelo, when he was first born, he had fantastic eye contact, he started speaking, he was doing everything he was supposed to do. And then when he got to three years old, it was almost like someone took everything away from him. He lost his speech, he wouldn't look at me, he wouldn't even let me touch him, he was fixated on patterns on the wallpaper, he used to get um, items in the lounge. So say for example, he might get a clock, he might get a book, he might get a pencil, a cup, and he would line them across the floor and they'd, I'm sure if I'd have got a tape measure that they would have been perfectly spaced across the floor. And as soon as you moved them, that's when he was got very, very upset. He used to do that every day and I thought this can't be healthy for him, so I started moving them around. He then was fixated on holding a blue brick and he would carry it everywhere with him. And when we lost the brick, oh, it was the end of the world. So I bought 12 bricks. <laughs> At least I've got back up. So um, Angelo, as I say, lost everything. I didn't get any support at all from the London Borough of Hillingdon where I lived. I was told by the SEN officer that the ball was in my court and it was down to me to find the right type of school for my boys. Patrick was going to mainstream school and he was really, really struggling. 
he became very angry, he became very anxious, he was drawing pictures of him in his school uniform and steam coming out of his ears. He would get cornflake boxes and make them into a detonator and that was, he was going to blow the school up. He, he was very, very anxious. But I didn't know what had happened was that he'd got diagnosed when he was four years old and the consultant paediatrician didn't tell me. So I was going through three years of taking him into school, him trying to get over the steering wheel. Please don't take me to that place. You're not showing me respect to take me to that school. You're being mean to take me to that school. There's eyes in the door that are looking at me. And later on, I found out that the eyes were two O's in the word classroom. So those were the eyes that were looking at him. Then he would say, there was a big mouth that swallowed him up when they went into the hall. And I was thinking, a mouth, a mouth. And later on, it was the doors as he was going into the hallway. Because he didn't like everybody clapping if someone was honoured with a certificate or something. He didn't like the scraping of the chairs. And also in the classroom, if the teacher said, when they were all sitting on the carpet, everybody stand up, go to your desk and get on with your work. So everyone would stand up, but Patrick would sit on the chair or sit on the carpet. And because she hadn't said, Patrick, please can you stand up and sit on the chair? and do your work, because she wasn't specific enough. But obviously, we didn't know at that time that Patrick had been diagnosed. So we went through three years of no sleeping, sleepwalking, anxiety, you name it, we were going through it. And then, one particular day, I remember trying to get Angela out the buggy, trying to get Patrick into school. I used to hate all the looks of pity from the parents looking at you. And one day, I always remember the gate to the school was opposite the road where you parked, and he had his head buried in the wall and he was really sobbing. And there was one teacher, I saw him, she went to get the head teacher, she came out and she just said, what are we doing to this young man? So we had a meeting. And because of all the difficulties that we were going through with Patrick, you know, trying to find out what was going on, he was going for therapy, the therapist couldn't make it to a meeting. So we had a, a meeting with the teachers, the therapists, the, um, his one-to-one -one support that he had at the time. Um, and I didn't know why he had the one to one support, but obviously we couldn't get him into the classroom. There was all these things, he was getting bullied. Um, there was just a whole ream of problems poor Patrick was going through. So the um, therapist sent a report to the meeting because she couldn't make it, so we were dished out it. And then I got the report and I went, Patrick was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome in 1994. I thought, what? I didn't know that. And then and because I knew about Asperger's, because I'd been reading about autism, because Angelo had been diagnosed early on, I thought, and the head teacher said, Mrs. Kennedy, why didn't you tell us that Patrick had Asperger's syndrome? And I said, because I didn't know. And you know what? I couldn't concentrate on the rest of the meeting. I felt like an explosion had gone off in my head. I still remember that feeling of blood rushing from my feet, going to my head thinking, I've got two children with autism. What did I do wrong? I can't have done anything wrong. I don't drink, I don't smoke. Maybe it was because I had preeclampsia and toxemia. But do you know what? They've never changed. They've always the same. It's just that they've got a label. So the teachers told us that they couldn't meet Patrick's needs. They couldn't meet Angelo's needs. So I had two sons at home that didn't have anywhere to go to. And that's when the local authority said the ball was in my court. They also told me that my sons were unique and there weren't any other children in Hillingdon that had a diagnosis of autism. Yeah. So, one day, I bumped into a mum. And she, I saw her really struggling with her son. And I thought, mm, I recognise the way the behaviour is going here. So I said, is there anything I can do to help you? And she said, she started crying and she just said, I'm really sorry. She said, um, I said, don't do need to apologise. She said, my son's been diagnosed with semantic pragmatic language disorder and he's finding it really difficult to go to school. I don't know anybody else. And so anyway, we started chatting and I said, there must be other parents who've got children who are autistic. So what we did was, I put an article in the local newspaper and I always remember it was in the Uxbridge Gazette and I'm still friends with the reporter and 275 families came out of the woodwork. So considering we're the only ones, so 275 families. So we started a support group. Um, we started with a few parents at first in my lounge, then it got bigger, so I thought we'd better move somewhere else. So we went into a church hall, and that's when we thought, there's more parents who've got children at home, they're really struggling, they're trying to go to work. They're... By the way, is anyone in the wide awake club who stays up at night with their sons and daughters? Put your hand up with you, lack of sleep and you'd love. 
Yeah, my son Angelo, 25, sorry to say, he's still not sleeping well. I've had uh, three and a half, four hours in two days. He's having a particularly bad week this week. So um, I'm surprised I can put one foot in front of the other because I'm so tired. That's why I've made notes because when I get really tired, my brain's like jelly. So parents were in a similar situation to ourselves. Then there was a gentleman whose son had been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome and his son was in the mental health unit and his son was misdiagnosed with schizophrenia and he didn't have schizophrenia, he had Asperger's syndrome and they gave him medication for schizophrenia. So his primary condition wasn't Asperger's syndrome, it was psychotic episodes that he was getting from the medication. So he came to the group and he said, I need to get my son out of the mental health unit. He said, if you go in there, he said, you wouldn't even put a dog in there. So I said, okay, so I went along with him to meet his son. Like the ache in my heart, it was a dreadful place. They've changed it now because they've um, made a new unit. But at that time, he was mixed in with people who had drink problems, like all manner of mental health issues. He had a curtain that just separated him from the other chap that was in the next bed, and it was ripped. There was food up the wall. The seats, when you sat down, your bum hit the floor. It was just like, oh my God, how are people supposed to get better in this place? So what we decided to do was, we thought we'll set up a school first. Well, what do I know about setting up schools? But he told me about a building that they were gonna knock down and build 37 flats. So I climbed over the fence. I remember I had a pencil skirt on. And I looked in the window and I thought, this, this is perfect. It used to be a school for children that had physical disabilities. And because the doors weren't wide enough, they were gonna knock it down and build another school for seven million pounds down the road. So I went to the head of client services and I said, is there any chance that this school could be made for children with autism or autistic children? And she said, let me make some inquiries. And I always remember she was head of client services and her name was Mary Milne and we became friends afterwards. She always said to me, I knew there was something different about you. She said, you never took the word no. So um, to cut a long story short, they made us go through a feasibility study we had to do a business plan. Luckily, my husband had just qualified and he did an economics and management degree. And we put a business plan together. And then the local authority said, you need to raise £627,000 worth of refurbishment in order for you to open the school. We're not going to give you the key unless you raise that amount of money. We had £3,000 in the bank. So I said, yeah, we can do it. And my husband just looked at me and said, are you mad? So I thought, we've got to do it, we have to do it, we can't live like this because Sean was going to work during the day, he came home, I was going to work during the night, or coming back at three, four o'clock, then I'd come in, then I'd be up for the rest of the day, then my boys were at home, they gave us five hours home tuition per week. One lady was amazing, I employed her later on as a teacher who was working with Patrick, but the other lady had never worked with a child with autism, and she started crying on the third day on my carpet in the lounge at home saying, I don't know what to do. Not her fault, but she'd never worked with a child who was autistic before that was like Angelo. So I thought, every book I was reading, it was like, early intervention is crucial. Early intervention is crucial. I thought, where is it? I can't seem to get any. So that's why I thought, when I said to the group, we need to open the school. Again, everyone looked at me as if I was mad. I said, well, what other option have we got? There's a school sitting there, we need to do it. So we put the feasibility study together, we put the business plan together, and we started going to banks. And the banks were saying, oh, great story, shut the door on the way out. Because we didn't have any experience of opening the school. So in the end, Barclays Bank, the listening bank, <laughs> there was a chap who had worked with children with special educational needs who was the manager. And you, I always find that people who've helped me throughout these 20 years are people who've either got kids who are autistic or related or have experience. So he said, I can't give you the 627 grand, but I can write a letter in such a way that the local authority will give you the lease. I thought, that'll do. So we got the letter and then the local authority said, okay, we'll give you the keys. But you have to prove within six months that you're doing the work, because they gave us a list of works that had to be done, new roof, this and that and the other. Like, the people that were in there, they'd smashed it. Like, they'd smashed the toilets, they'd smashed the sinks. I thought, why? 
and like there's trees growing through the windows. So anyway, the first, I always remember the first day, there was myself, my husband, there was two other people, we went in, we started painting the first room. <laughs> my husband's not DIY orientated at all. He had more paint in his hair than he had on the scene. I thought, God, we need help here. So I went to the probation service. I said, can you help me? So they said they would come at weekends. He said, but you've got to be on site with us. Yep, I can do that. So then we went to the Prince's Trust. So I went to, and I put an article again in the local newspaper by my friend, Barbara Fisher. I said, I need help. So all these people started coming out the woodwork, granddads, families that wanted their children to go to the school. And it was supposed to be a three year development plan and we did it in nine months, and it's because I am so driven. Like, when I get a bee in my bonnet, it's just like, no one's stopping me, I'm doing it. If I say I'm gonna do something, it gets done. I can't bear it when people say they're gonna do something and they don't do it. It's just like, it's gotta happen. So we did it, and um, 19 children walked through the door. And my two sons were funded two weeks before we opened the school. They weren't gonna fund them to go to the bloody school. <laughs> I thought so you've got to be joking after we've done all of this. And I was getting three hours respite a week. That's all they'd give me. So I used to take Patrick and Angelo with me to work, you know, set up a little classroom so that um, one of the teachers could go in there for five hours. And I don't even know how I did it. We were juggling. We had no money. I was living on nine pentings of Aldi's beans. I was sick of looking at them. But it, that was the way we had to do it. So now there's 195 children that tra travel in from 19 different local authorities. And I love that school. And it's, if you think about it as well, we had to set up a school in such a way that it would work because Patrick and Angelo were so different to each other. You've got Patrick who's got Asperger's syndrome and you've got Angelo that's non-verbal, you know, he needs more one-to-one -one support, he needs intensive speech and language therapy. But it, we made it work. I put an ad, um, advert in for a head teacher. I thought, how do I write an advert for a head teacher? How, how do I write it? So um, I was looking in, someone said, look in the TES. I looked in the TES. So we put an advert in and we got nine replies. Some cranks, like, I can't even tell you. There's one lady, she was nine, 89. She came with a bobbly hat, a kilt. And I just, <laughs> what? And then there's another chap that wrote his application on Zippy and Bungle Rainbow application paper. And it was just like, I was thinking, we're never going to get anyone here. But the last person, her um, application form actually came in on the closing day. She had 20 years of experience of working with children who are autistic. She used to be a speech and language therapist. I thought, she's going to got to be it. And I remember she walked through the door and she saw Patrick. And Patrick didn't like talking to people at that time. It was like that. So she was saying, what are you reading, Patrick? So she, he said, dinosaur. Dinosaur, sorry. <laughs> Dinosaurs. But she got round him like that. I thought, I don't even need, even need to interview her. Shh. She's the one. And she was the one. So it's been a crash course in everything. I've learned everything. But if I had to do it again, I would. So as my boys got older, I was thinking, oh, where's Angela going to go? There's no colleges around here. There's only one like 250 miles away. And there's no one down there. Oh, we've got to set up a college. So my husband said, <laughs> I had three hours respite. They took it off me because I had a school. I thought, what? I need more respite. No. Anyway, so what we did was we opened a vocational college. We found a hospital that were for people who had back problems. And it was only going to be up for four years because it was on a footprint that basically it had to be knocked down. So I thought, we've never owned a college before. Mm, I wonder if it's harder than opening the school. Uh, blah blah blah. So anyway, in the end, we opened a vocational college for adults, and um, again, it was for 16, right up to 50, 55 year old. We had a gentleman that came to us. So now um, we've got three sites, and there are 50 adults that come to us, age 16. Um, I'd say 50 years old is probably the eldest. We then opened a residential home for eight adults, um, and that's a stepping stone so they can go into supported living. And then um, two or three years down the line, we opened another school in Kent, um, and now there's like 70 children that go there. So that's like a little bit of a background. So I had a crash course in absolutely everything. So just a little bit about Patrick and Angelo. So Patrick, as I say, was very, very anxious, and he was always overthinking, difficulty switching off, 
poor sleep pattern, angry, anxious, and I think a lot of it stemmed from being bullied at school. Angelo had real difficulties with his senses, so his sight, sound, touch, feel, taste. Sometimes, which I couldn't get my head around, that we would we like walking and it's a great stress buster. And I didn't used to like walking before, but I love walking with Angela and we walk miles. We do 10 mile walk to raise money for the charity. And, um, but there's certain times that we must have gone the routes like 50, 60 times. But when the sun comes out, it's almost like it's the first time for him. And he holds onto my arm and it's like, he's sort of walking like this. And I'm just thinking, you know, it's just that. Oh, I think autism is it's a big learning curve. You will never know everything that there is to know about autism. You will learn every single day. And I think it's made me a better person. I am fascinated by our kids at the school. I love to watch the progress that they make. Like sometimes it can just be like a, a little step. And it's huge for that family. It's huge for that child. It's huge for the staff. And it's just like... For me, it's, I know it, it's hard, I've got the t-shirt twice, it's hard for the parents, it's hard for the individual navigating through this world, but if you support your son or daughter, I know the system's hard as well, I, for me the system's like, right, how can we make their lives more difficult? Right, let's set up the EHCP, let's do this, let's do that, and it's almost like the, right, the PIP, like the disability living allowance form, you need a degree to fill out them things, and it's just like, it's almost like, why are you making our lives easier? Why are you making it more difficult? It's, that's the bit that I can't get my head around. So another thing with Angelo is like washing his hands. He could be washing his hands every day, it's fine. And then sometimes it's almost like he's been scalded by the water. So it's just different challenges. That's what I'm trying to get to you every day. He loves to squeeze his chips when he eats them and he flicks the end off each chip. I know, I love watching that too. Um, Holidays. You know what makes me laugh when it's term time? People go, have a, have a good holiday, have a good break. <laughs> what do you think of that then? <laughs> so I've written a book called Not Too Youth Bit. It was a while back um, when I had more time. And um, I just wanted to read you a little bit of it because what we did was we contributed um, a chapter about Angelo. Patrick's got a chapter of his own. My husband's got a chapter of his own. There's a little bit of a story. Um, it's, it's a bit outdated now, but I just wanted to read you this about holidays, which makes me laugh still. We haven't been on holiday as a family for about 17 years, because it's just too stressful. It's like, not a holiday. So, in the summer of 2003, when he was 10 years old, Angelo performed another disappearing act when we took a caravan holiday near Great Yarmouth in Norfolk. Undoubtedly, the worst holiday we've ever had. As always, Sean didn't want to come along, that's my husband, he doesn't like holidays and mourned nearly all the way there, and his mood didn't improve when the school Sunshine Variety Coach, which we had borrowed, broke down on the way. That's it, he said, we're going back. But desperate for a much needed break, me, I wouldn't hear of it. Once the coach was fixed, we continued on our way, but within three days of our scheduled week's holiday, Angelo went missing again. He went missing um, in next door's chimney, you name it. He likes heights. The higher he goes, the better he likes it. And I hate heights. So once the coach had fixed, we continued on our way, but within three days of our schedule, we told it Angela went missing. This time, he'd managed to get out of the caravan and noticed it didn't take a second, and off he went. As soon as we realised he'd gone, Sean whizzed off like a madman in the sunshine coach to look for Angelo, while Coral, my mother-in-law, who's been out a rock throughout um, our family's life, and I wandered around the site wandered, like rushing around the site, hoping to find him. I was worried sick because the site was situated near a steep cliff, which I didn't know at the time. My heart felt like it was coming out of my chest. I was hardly calmed when I heard a driver telling another that some nutter driving a sunshine coach had just cut him up. <laughs> it transpired that Angelo had decided to walk into someone else's caravan. But he, luck would have it, the caravan was occupied by a lady who just happened to be a special needs teacher who taught children with autism. Angela, it seems, just wandered in, sat down in front of the television, declared, I want to watch Bambi. <laughs> the lady contacted the site's information desk and then sat with Angelo until we arrived to collect him two to three hours after he had disappeared. That's it, declared Sean, pack the cases, we're going home, and that was the end of the holiday. <laughs> So, there we go. 
So since we've opened the schools, just one other thing that I wanted to say. People ask me what, what support and what's helped both Patrick and Angelo to get to 28 and 25. I'm pleased to say Patrick, three months ago, has just got himself a full-time job. Yay! And he's working at Pinewood Studios. He's, he's just like, what he said, I saw a post he put on Facebook. He stalks my Facebook and I stalk his. And um, he put, um, my mind is blown every day when I go into work. He said, uh, because I work in an environment that just means the world to me. So he invited me, because um, uh, they were, what they do is they show uh, screenings of films uh, that they have obviously produced there. So Patrick invited me along, so I thought, oh, I just want to see, to make sure he's all right, you know, like, mum. Even though they're 28, you never stop worrying. So I went along, and everyone was like, hi, Patrick. How are you doing? Are you excited? It's Jurassic World because they know he's mad about dinosaurs. He knows everything, everything about dinosaurs. And um, I just thought, he's fine. He's okay. And, you know, he gets up in the morning, seven o'clock, gets him dressed, he's, um, gets the bus, he's there. I'm really proud of him. So I thought the next step is to get his own place. So I said to Patrick, oh, now you've got a job and you've passed your six month probationary period, you'll be able to get yourself a flat. He said, are you trying to get rid of me? No comment. <laughs> so, um, so what's helped my sons throughout their lives? Setting up the school, obviously, because they were at home, not mixing with anybody, just me as, you know, taking them here, there and everywhere. And I felt a bit isolated because I'd moved from the North East, I didn't really know anyone. Always help them to be open to new experiences, no matter how hard it is. Sometimes it's difficult. But because Patrick and Angela are so different from each other, it's quite hard when I take them both out because they've both got different interests. Patrick used to use a dictaphone when he was stressed and he used to talk into the dictaphone. Another thing that I did for him, he was desperate to go into the town. And I thought, how am I going to let him go into the town in a way that it's comfortable for him and less anxious for me? So he got a mobile phone and I said, Patrick, make your way into the town and then once you're there, you can come straight back, but just try. It wasn't that far. So we thought, I went through lots of different things. So I said, you can ring me whenever you like. I remember him going out the door, I felt sick. I was walking up and down. Anyway, he rang me within like a few minutes. And I said, hi, Patrick. He said, right, I'm standing on a piece of grass. So I said, could you be a little bit more specific? <laughs> so he said, I said, where's the school? Is it on the right or is it left? But we talked it through. He got himself into the town. He came back. And since then, now he goes to Birmingham. He goes to Morton Keys. And I say to him, Always ring me when you get there and just say, all right, mum. And then when you're on your way back, just say, I'm on my way back, mum. That's all I need to know. I don't need to know what you're doing and all the rest of it. And that's what he does. But he does ring me quite a bit just to share what he's doing, which is really lovely. Another thing I would say is try not to let them switch off and get too involved in their iPads and on their computers and in the room and lock themselves away. And I know that can be really hard. Angelo was great with the iPad, but then he got really obsessed and he was just up with it all night. So I took the iPad away from him at night time. So now he just uses the computer. Um, be open-minded about things. You know, if you don't try, you'll never know. So, you know, Angelo used to find it difficult to go around the town. He didn't like the sound of motorbikes. He didn't like the sound of buses and cars. So just take it one step at a time. And that's what I did. With Angelo, because he had no speech, what I did was I used to take photographs of things that he really liked, like Rupert the Bear, the ball, the favourite swing that he liked, the park that he liked to go to, the food that he likes to eat, and then I would write the word under the picture. So I'd say, I started building up a, like a little album and said, this is where we're going, Angela, we're going to your, the swing that you like to go to, or we're going to the park that you like to go to, or we're going to have some monster munch, which he loves, which I can't stand the smell of pickled onion ones. Um, so those sort of things, those are what I did to sort of help them understand as well the world as much as they possibly can. <coughs> and also remember that everything that they do is not to do with their autism. They are kids, they're allowed to be naughty. You know, it's just that they're just, they're really naughty, they're really naughty. <coughs> I just wanted to share just a clip um, of the work of the charity. So I opened the charity in 2009 and that was because parents started writing to me about difficulties they were having with diagnosis, trying to find the right type of school, trying to find support. How do I fill out a disability living allowance form? How do I fill out a PIP? Um, what's the reasonable adjustment? You know, um, how do I find a job for my son? How, all these sort of things I thought, 
parents are still going through the same stuff I went through all those years ago. So I thought, we need to set up a charity. So we set up Anna Kennedy Online. Someone told me just recently, they said it sounds like a porn site. I thought, what? <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's called Anna Kennedy Online. And um, I've got a team of volunteers that work with me and I've got, they're amazing. I couldn't do what I do without my team of volunteers. So I just wanted to share with you um, a little bit what the charity does. So um, Ryan, who's one of my, all my charity patrons, ambassadors, um, champions, they're either autistic or their parents of children who are autistic. So we're all, we're a really tight team and we work well together. So I just wanted to show you last year what we did and this year we've been even busier. So if we could just show the clip. So Ryan has put this together. He looks after our YouTube channel. Diagnosis. What's diagnosis like in Wales? How long do you have to wait? Sorry? Hit and miss. So it's a bit of a postcode lottery. Yeah? A little bit, um, obviously, uh, where we are. So I had a lot of parents that started ringing me, writing to me and saying, we've waited a year, we've waited two years for a diagnosis of autism. It's causing a lot of problems, it's having an effect on the family. So I thought on social media, I'm just going to put a question out there and see if people will respond, which I did. I got like a hundred messages within something like a couple of hours. So I thought I'm going to put a survey together, which we did. And within a couple of weeks, we got 2,000 families that completed the survey. So it was questions were asked about the diagnosis process, which ranged from when the condition was first suspected to when the diagnosis process was first initiated and how long it took before it was completed. So what came out of that was that over half of the parents had noticed difficulties, problems that their son or daughter might be experiencing and it took on average five years out of the 2,000 families that completed the survey to go from starting the process to the end of the process. 
We had some families that had waited 10 years, 15 years. Actually spoke to a gentleman that was 73 years old and he'd been diagnosed. And he said, I don't want to do anything with it. He said, I just want to know. And then once he did get a diagnosis, he said, he just felt like a big weight had been lifted from his shoulders. And he just said, that's all I wanted. I don't want to do anything with it. So I also met Dr. Laura Crane, who works at Goldsmith University. And while we were doing our survey, I didn't know she was doing a survey with professionals, so speech and language therapists, educational psychologists. So they were putting a survey together. And what results came out of her survey and what results came out of ours mirrored each other. So 91% of the families were given a diagnosis through the NHS, 9% privately. So some families were actually maxing out their credit cards, spending up to like £5,000. 63% of the families stated the process was poor to average. With regards to the professionals involved, 55% were assessed as being between average to poor when it came to working together with others for the benefit of the child or the adult concerned. 54% of the participants found the process difficult. 71% of the participants shared that it was not easy to find vital information as to how to obtain a diagnosis, nor in many cases was it explained where a diagnosis should be obtained. So as I said, over 50% of the families from when they first suspected had waited up to five years. Two parents asked me if I'd share their comments. I said, I would, so I am. So the process was scary, emotionally destroying, I was first blamed as the reason for over two years with CAMS. Then in one glorious day, four experts on autism diagnosed our son in under two hours. Though we were longer, we were there longer. There was no grief, just pure relief at knowing we could move forward and it was not my fault. One other um, comment. We knew Emily was autistic from when she was two. We were involved with lots of professionals, yet none were prepared to diagnose her. She was eventually diagnosed at nine with autism and learning difficulties. The waiting list for assessment for autism was horrendous, so we said we thought she had ADHD. The list was shorter. She was assessed and they said no to ADHD, but yes to autism. Seven whole years of utter frustration and schooling that didn't work as for her as a result. Um, I did speak to a, um, a parent actually, well, a couple of parents actually from Wales, and they told me that um, they'd been waiting on average two years for an autism assessment, despite a target of six month figures. And they also shared with me that the Welsh Government has set a target of 26 weeks, is that right? From referral to diagnosis, but a freedom of information request to local health boards revealed on average people waiting 107 weeks. So that was something that she shared with me. Again, with the charity, um, we, I got parents that were contacting me about the children being bullied at school, online, within the community. Um, they were just sharing some real horror stories, which I won't share with you, just like real heartbreaking stories. So I thought I need to do something, so I spoke to the NSPCC, I worked with Anti-Bullying um, Alliance, and we created something called Give Us a Break. A lot of children in mainstream are bullied in lunchtime, and that's because it's the most unstructured time, where they're trying to make friends, they don't know how to. I always remember when Patrick was younger, he wanted to make friends, but he didn't know how to ask. And he would go up to a child, stroke them on their face, and then they'd push him over, because that's his way of saying, I want to make friends. So we put a campaign together. The uh, NSPCC said that when they launched the um, Give Us a Break campaign, when they put it on their website, because they had no information at that time, which was quite a few years ago, on autism, they said they had the most hits ever that year of the anti-bullying week um, of teachers wanting to find out more information. So then, parents, children, adults, were contacting me, sharing with me amazing videos of them singing, dancing, magicians, musicians, bands, you name it. And I was looking, I was just thinking, oh my God, they're really, really good. And I thought, we've got to do something with this. And at that time, I'd been invited to a show because I'd met Debbie Moore, who was the founder of Pineapple Dance Studios. And I was at the Woman of the Year event, and I went to her table and I just said, I've got all of these videos and I want to do something with them, I want to put on a show. So she said, we're actually having a show with Pineapple Performing Arts at the Mermaid Theatre. So she said, would you like to come along and watch what we do? So I said, oh, I'd love to. 
So I went to the theatre, I fell in love with it, and I thought, I've got to do something here. We have to put on a show. So I spoke to Maggie Patterson, who we're now great friends now for the last eight years, and I said, I want to do Autumn's Got Talent. So she said, okay, then I'll go with you. I'll, I'll support you. I said, but I don't want it to be a competition because I think it would add to the anxiety. I just want it to be a showcase. I want to do it in the centre of London to show what these children and adults, how fantastic they are. So I remember we did it in 2012. It was quite... I was quite anxious because if you think about it, you've got 20 performers traveling from all over the country and we're putting a show together in two days. So we did the rehearsals, um, families were coming along, but you know what, it was the best thing ever. People talked about it for weeks and weeks. It made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. So I thought we've got to do it again. And the other amazing thing was that like some of the celebrities that came, they said, oh, we didn't expect to be entertained. Why wouldn't you expect to be entertained? So I just want to show you just three short clips and I'll tell you a little bit about each person because since we've been doing Autumn's Got Talent, it's created a springboard for the adults and children to do other things. So one of our magicians now is going around um, doing uh, weddings and um, another young man's now a DJ and a radio station. Um, another young man um, has gone to a ballet school. So th this is Calvin, who um, is 18, amazing young man, and he's, he's the um, ambassador for MIND, and he's done quite a bit of stuff for me. And this is Charlotte, and she had a very poor prognosis and was told she would never speak. So she started talking when she was five, when she was watching Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Dwarfs? So, so, I told you I was tired. Seven Dwarfs, and she started singing. And her mum ran down the stairs and she nearly fell over. She was folding the clothes and she thought, where's that voice coming from? And it was her daughter singing. So she's got a lovely voice. So the other story behind this is that they met on Autumn's Got Talent, but they live at opposite end of the country and they wanted to sing Phantom of the Opera. So they were Skyping each other and they were practicing via Skype. And the first time they sang this was on the stage. So everyone was blown away. You have to be at the show to experience what I'm talking about. It's great on here, but when you're actually in the theatre and you experience it, it's, it's just like something else. <laughs>
how many did he say to me when he came off? Did I make you proud? Of course you did. Right, so the next clip was on ITV. Now, Erica, she, I met Erica in Cardiff. She, we were doing, uh, I was a judge for creative. Uh, now, a teenager from Gloucester has helped to record. It was creative arts media. There was like an art competition that went on here. I was one of the judges, and that's where I met Erica. And Erica was very, very shy. She wouldn't speak to anybody, but she loved to sing. So I met her mum, and then she performed on Autumn's Got Talent, and then we have created a charity single. And then she went on television, and it's something about Autumn's Got Talent that gives them the confidence to think, I can do this. I'm not a second-class citizen. I can do this. I want to do something with it. So I just want to show you Erica from going from somewhere where she, she never used to speak to anyone. I'm so proud of her. I got really emotional when I watched this interview. Or a charity single to raise awareness of autism. Erica Winkley was diagnosed with the condition at the age of two. She wants to make Gloucestershire more autism friendly. Well, the song has been released as part of World Autism Awareness Week. We'll be speaking to Erica in a moment. But first, let's have a listen to the song. And I'm delighted to say that Erica has joined us in the studio. Erica, thanks very much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's a fantastic song. You must be so pleased. And it was released on Monday. Mm -hmm. How's it gone down? Have people liked it? Yeah, judging by the response I've gotten from friends and family. Um, I'm hoping that it's going to be a success and on a personal level, but also to raise funds for the charity and the amazing work that they do in uh, supporting autism acceptance and awareness. And like, I think the thing is, there's such um, a negative bias in our larger culture surrounding autism, so it's refreshing to see it in such a positive light. Mm. And the, the single was originally sung by the, the singer Jay Rock, his son has autism, and that's sort of how the collaboration came about. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so how the whole thing's got started. Um, I was involved in an art competition, I was a contestant in that, and one of the judges was a singer-songwriter named uh, Aaron York. And through that, I got involved in a charity album called Building Bridges, which was produced and featured artists on the autism spectrum. So through that, Anna, who's head of the charity, told us that um, J-Rock gave us this single for us to cover, and it all kind of spiralled from there. You mentioned about autism and how it's kind of perceived in society. What do you think needs to change to make that better? I think this is a very good starting point because like, I have an ambition of uh, raising the profile of autism, especially in women and girls, because uh, I think um, it's so thought of as a male-only condition that a lot of girls go into the radar. Um, on the single alone, it was just me and Marie. Male-female ratio was six to two, but I think that brought me and Marie closer, just having someone with her abilities gave me a bit of a confidence boost. Mm. So uh, hopefully that will be a good starting point. Mm. And you've mentioned some of the perhaps the stereotypes that people have around autism. Mm -hmm. What is it like when you're out and about? Do, do, do people say things? Do people? Do you feel that people are are judging you in a way? To an extent, yeah. Um, but it's hard in all aspects of my life. Um, like in school, in college, I've always felt like I was different. Uh, some days, on like the worst days, I've almost felt like I was broken but um for the single i think there's been a strong support network because like traveling and staying in a weird hotel um was stressful to me but um the charity have done such great work in helping us get through it and i think the message that i want the autistic community to take from the single is with the right support anything is possible you can do anything that you put your mind to if people are watching this, Erica, and thinking that they, they don't know much about autism and maybe don't know how to speak to someone with autism or react around them, what would you say to them? Well, I'm just like you on the inside, really. I'm a person, a human being, so I have my difficulties, but as long as you understand that, and then I hope we can be friends. <laughs> Erica, you've done, you know, you've done so well. Your voice is absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you. Um, and we've really enjoyed speaking to you today. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks, guys. Did she do well? 
Like from a girl that didn't want to talk to anyone, I was so proud of her. Mum was just like on cloud 65. Um, so um, I think I'm probably running out of time. So just very briefly, our charity, we offer training, we're going to schools. Um, one of our ambassadors wanted to um, create something called Aston's Way because um, he was frightened of the police um, and that sort of thing. So what we're doing is we're working in collaboration with the Autism Reality Experience. And what that is, is a bus that was created by mom. And basically you go through the experience and you experience what it's like to have a sensory overload. They also provide training and it goes across the country. So if you can get it to Wales, it's, um, it's really, really, really good. Um, so what we did was, uh, we, did it, we took it to Essex because that's where Aston lives and his mum and dad are my charity champions in Essex. So we got 180 first responders, so that was police, ambulance, um, police ambulance and uh, police ambulance, fire, fire service. Yeah, how can I forget the firemen? Um, so they came along and do you know what also happened? It opens up discussion. Sometimes they hadn't shared that they had an autistic son or daughter or, and they just started chatting and that was a, a really nice thing to see as well. So the commander of, um, I've got one minute. Um, the commander um, basically said he really liked what happened on that day because we spent the whole day there. So they're gonna take it across the whole of Essex. So that's really exciting to raise awareness. So it's called the Autism Reality Experience. So if you wanna check it out, um, it's under training to care, so that's training with the number two to care, So, and it's the Autumn Reality Experience, and you'll see um, some information on there. If you want to see the work of the charity, it's www.annakennedyonline.com. Uh, we're a national charity, but we're made up of volunteers, we're very passionate about what we do. Um, we do Autumn's Got Talent, as I say, so if there's any budding singers, dancers, comedians, whatever it is that you do, artwork. The closing date is December the 31st, so check out the website and um, if you want to uh, nominate someone and then what we do is we choose, which is really, really tough, 20 performers from across the country. And we take it to as a roadshow, we've just come back from St Ives, so what we do is we take 10 performers from the main show in London and then we open the auditions up to St Ives, like for example we're going to Liverpool in November, so we opened the auditions up to Liverpool, so we've got 10 performers from Liverpool, so um, you never know, we might come to Wales one day, and uh, we could do Autumn's Got Talent here. Do you know what, it's like the best thing ever, and I'll keep going on about it, but I just love it so much. And also, just very quickly, um, Simon Cowell tried to stop me from using Got Talent. I got a letter from Fremantle, the solicitor, saying you can't use Got Talent, and it was just the way it was worded that really got my back up. So I thought I'm going to the Sun newspaper, even though I think it's rubbish, but I thought it's got the most readership. So I went to the Sun newspaper and the um, reporter said, oh, I need to get a comment from Simon or his camp. So I went, all right then. So they basically went to them. And um, the head of Psycho, uh, who um, obviously works with Simon, was trying to get hold of me. Every I was in a meeting, he rang the helpline, he rang the college, he rang the school, he wanted to talk to me. So then one of the girls knocked on the door because I was in a meeting and they just said, Anna, um, someone called Ben from Psycho wants to talk to you. So I said, what's it about? I said, oh, it's to do with Got Talent. I said, oh, tell him I'll ring him back in a couple of hours. <laughs> so I did. So I rang him back and I could hear Simon Cowell in the background and he must have turned around to him and gone. He went, hello, Anna. I went, hello. I said, you trying to get hold of me? He said, yes, I understand you're doing some great work. He said, and you want to do something called Autumn's Got Talent. Great idea, but you can't use Got Talent. So I said, why not? So he said, oh, because, you know, you'd be setting a precedent. So I said, well, everybody else is using Got Talent. All the schools are using, Tesco's have just done, Tesco's Got Talent. I said, why are you picking on us? Are we supposed to be flatters or something that you've chosen our little charity? I said, I've bought all the pull-ups with Autumn's Got Talent. We've got all of the marketing stuff. He said, oh, I totally get what you're saying. He said, but, you know, off the record, you know, if it was me, I would let you do it. But on the record, we can't be seen, you know, the solicitors, blah, blah, blah. So I just wasn't having any of it. So he said to me, you're not going to give in, are you? So I went, no. So he said, how about if I give you four tickets to the final of The X Factor and Britain's Got Talent? I said, I don't want them. I said, I want to do Autumn's Got Talent. So he said, can you hold off on the story till tomorrow? So I said, okay. So anyway, the reporter rang me and said, what did he say, what did he say? So I said, he's told me to hold up on the story, which I did. So anyway, the next day he rang me, because I said I would give him till 11 o'clock the next day. 
So he rang me at 5 to 11 and he said, Hi Anne, I've got some great news. He said, you've got the license to use autumn has Got Talent. I was going, get in. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's why we could use autumn. But it wasn't that like really silly. It's just to me it was silly. But anyway. So anyway, that's me. If you want to follow me on social media, I post every single day, morning, noon and night, when I'm up in the middle of the night, where I'm chatting to parents, uh, chat to parents all over the world. Uh, so if you want to share something, if you want to share a really feel-good story, we're happy to put it on the charity website. Um, so yeah, so I'm at Anna Kennedy one on Twitter, Anna Kennedy Online on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram as well. And I do all my own posts, because it has to come with me. So if I'm up in the middle of the night, I tell everyone I'm up in the middle of the night. So we just chat. Um, yeah, so that's me. And thank you for listening to me. And I wish you all the best with your sons and daughters. The best thing to do is never give in. Keep fighting. Because if you don't speak up for your children, who's going to do it? Thank you. <laughs>